hit the share screen button. I'll get the screen on. And I'll start by just thanking everybody for uh, giving me this opportunity to share some uh, knowledge and experience with you. Let's make sure this works. You guys tell me if you are seeing the slide. Excellent. OK, so this talk was really born out of one of my other passions, which is analytical thinking. And for those of you that don't know, I started out in IT as a business analyst. Um, I was a business person before that. So my career actually started in uh, insurance. I was an insurance broker and then went into insurance underwriting before I was nabbed to go and work on a project at head office and uh, help business people talk to IT people back when I was using a Pentium something or other. I think it was a Pentium 2. I think we all got excited about the, uh, the disk drive that didn't slide in and out. Now I'm showing my age. Um, anyway, that's where I discovered that the job that I was doing was a business analyst. And I, I was a business analyst for a very long time. In fact, I came to New Zealand on a business analyst uh, talent visa. And so it's always been a passion of mine. And this, this slide pack was really talking about the observation of mine over the last 15 years of, of the reduction in analytical thinking that I've been observing um, within teams within my own workplaces, um, whether that's where I am now or with some of the comp companies that I consulted with. So when I was with Pre-Sky City, um, I was a consultant with a number of different consultancies and, and worked with about 45 different companies over the five years that I was doing that, five, six years. And so these are some of my observations and I still keep in touch with a few people and so they've been validated. And I wanted to put this in front of you tonight and just take you through um, what I think we should do about it. And then at the end, we can open it up for some questions. But before we get started, let's have a quick working agreement with you guys because uh, I don't like just talking to an empty screen. I do like to uh, to interact with people. Um, and so if you want to, um, it's OK for you to ask questions as we go through. Um, I don't mind if you turn your mic off and just, hey, Nick, can I interrupt you? In fact, that's my preferred way because I don't I don't always see the little ha digital hand go up on the screen. So if you have a question or I've said something that you need clarification on, please, please, please stop me and ask me to explain it in a different way or repeat it, whatever you need. Um, interact with the content. What I mean by that is you guys on the call have experience too. Um, I'd be really interested to hear that experience or if you've got any stories to share that are in a similar vein where you can give some, some advice or give some experience from your own context, then please do. Uh, don't mind heckling either. So if you think I'm wrong and you want to call it out or you think you've got a better example, then please do that too. And I, I'm assuming, uh, Ziggy, you're going to be handling all of the admit things that come up on my screen, yeah? Yeah, I'm, I'm awesome. really clicking away as, as, as you speak there. <laughs> Good stuff. All right. And, and last point I think I've already covered there, which is share examples. I'm going to be sharing real world examples with real world photos that I, I've taken as part of my photo diary over the last uh, five years. So I'll be putting those up, but happy to hear any of yours as we go through. If we go down a rabbit hole, <clears throat> um, then I'll probably call that out. But if I can answer questions quickly, I will do that. So with no further ado, let's start here. So we're agents of change, um, and I've been an agent of change ever since I became a business analyst, and, and I also see a, an agile coach as an agent of change. And so I want to talk about how we enact change in others um, as those agents of change, whether you are a business analyst background or whether you're a developer or whatever, whatever your role is within your agile team whether you're a scrum master or a coach or a product owner, it doesn't really matter. Um, we're going to go through how we, how we, a process and a framework where we can enact change in others. I'm going to share my approach that I use with you guys, and, and we'll, we'll actually use that same approach as we go through these slides, just so you can get a feeling for how it works. Um, and maybe it's something that you can adopt. Um, I will be introducing some analysis techniques that I use um, and have used and, and they're, you know, my firm favorites. Um, but what I won't be doing is I won't have time to teach you how to actually use them. 
for that, you're going to have to buy my DVD that, no. I'll, I'll... However, potentially there's a follow on session in there for maybe some of the, the core techniques that maybe you guys want to learn how to use, but I'm definitely going to talk about them. I just won't have time to go into them in detail. So let's start with a question. Which buttons can we push in this aeroplane without crashing? So turn your mics on and let me hear you. Can we push, and let me turn my little laser pointer on. I, I figured out how to do this. Here we go, laser pointer. You see the laser pointer? Can I push that button? Mm -hmm. If I push that button, will this plane crash? Not it, saying could. it could. It could. Someone's saying it could. Maybe. Maybe. Maybe yeah. All right. What about if I push this button down here? What do you Isn't it plane parked on the ground? Ah, somebody's been to my presentation before. <laughs> <laughs> and I should have asked that first. Is there any pilots on the call? And has anybody ever seen this presentation before? Because I did give a version of this at the at the uh, IIBA chapter meeting. But look, whoever said that, that's a really good question or a really good point. When I run this and I ask people, can I push this button? Can I push this button? Some people say, yes, 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 absolutely. Or some people say no. And for me, I don't know enough about what's going on in this picture to actually be able to make a decision. So is it right for me to jump in and start making decisions when I've got a lack of information at this point? I don't know. I've purposely chosen this picture. So you can't tell whether this plane is on the runway or not. You'd actually have to ask me and I would tell you, but only one person asked. And so the reason why I'm, I'm taking this approach is I want you to understand that, that to be able to change something, we really need to understand the, the scope of what it is that we're changing and the state that it's currently in before we change it. And this reminds me of when I first learned to do first aid and I was taught that if there's a crash on the motorway, before you go and jump into the middle of the road and help somebody who needs help, it would be pretty useless if, if you then got hit by a car as well. Um, and so you always need to understand what the scenario is or the situation is before you jump in there. And that's really what this presentation is, is going to be all about, is really re-emphasizing the fact that we sometimes are jumping in too soon and trying to do things with not enough information. I'm going to share another story with you here. I'm full of these, these stories. If, I, if you get bored of my stories, just tell me and I'll shut up. This is, a, this is a quarry that um, I didn't jump into, but my brother-in-law, was he's a Scottish, and uh, he loved jumping in quarries. And what this picture shows you is if you're not aware of what's in the quarry before you jump into it, it can be dangerous. It can be very dangerous because quarries are usually filled in at the end of, uh, of, of mining with leftover machinery that just stays beneath the surface. And if the water is not clear, you're jumping into an area that is uh, dangerous. Do I need to know what the entire lake looks like from a, a, you know, what's under the surface? No, I don't need to understand the entire lake. I just need to understand the bit that I'm going to jump into. So that's the real takeaway from this slide is, making sure you understand something about what you're about to change and, and understanding that you don't need to understand all of it, just the, just the boundaries around the bits you're going to change. Let's get some definitions out of the way. What is analytical thinking? So there's quite a few definitions if you go searching for them, but this is the one that really resonated with me. <clears throat> And when I read it, it's kind of almost the core of my current job description. Um, defining problems. So identifying and defining problems. So defining problems, not just order taking solution statements. If any of you have ever interacted with BAs, um, I mean, not necessarily just business analysts, just uh, business in general, I would imagine that a number of you have experienced this where a business stakeholder will come to you and say, I need an iPhone. 
I need a red button. I need a thing. I've seen this on the web and that's what we need. And somebody just writes it down and goes, okay, he needs this thing. That That's not identifying or defining problems. I call that order taking. Two is extracting that key information from data. So data is this collection of facts um, and information is, is what we use or what we create from that facts. Facts are essentially usually raw data and it's unorganized. And as part of analytical thinking, we take that raw data and we turn it into information that we can use and, and find something valuable to do with. Three is about developing workable solutions for the problems we've identified. Typically cheap, workable solutions um, that we can test to see if our hypothesis regarding the root cause of the problem um, is actually right or wrong, or if it's going to be a good solution problem pair. Testing and verifying that. And then five is, is the development of the actual solution. So that's where the rubber hits the road and you actually have verified and your original hypothesis. And now you're actually going to build the, the final solution itself. So for me, this is what analytical thinking does. And, and I thought it would be useful because when I talk to people about it, they do get a bit confused between analytical thinking and critical thinking. And so we'll just differentiate that, that critical thinking is used to interpret factual information to create an opinion um, that determines whether something is right or wrong uh, or to make sense of something. Um, you use reasoning to reach a conclusion. It's, it's, it's a bit of a skill. Um, in a similar vein, uh, analytical thinking uses factual information to analyze a problem and to help find a solution for it, typically through relational links or causality. And what I mean by that is if, if I do this, then that should happen. And if I don't do this, then something else should happen. And so in a nutshell, analytical thinking is about analyzing a problem to find a solution and critical thinking is, is about analyzing information to um, to create an opinion and determine whether something is right or wrong or makes sense. So they're, they're quite different, but they do overlap. There is some overlapping. So now that we understand what it is, let's just talk about the approach we're going to use for this, this slide deck. So if anybody's a fan of Mike Cohen, you'll probably recognize this because it's from his book um, that I read many, 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 many years ago. Um, and I really do like this, not just because I like it. I like it because it works. Um, it works and has been working for me for my entire uh, career as an agile coach. And so this idea of uh, awareness being the place to start and making sure that there is some awareness within your team or value stream or organization, doesn't really matter where you want to start, but we're going to use team as the example here. Let's imagine that you have a team who isn't aware that they have a problem. You're not going to be able to move to desire until you build an awareness with your team that they've actually got a problem. So the idea is you get that awareness, and we'll talk about how in a moment, but we want to get to desire so that people actually have the desire to change. Um, I like to think uh, there's a story I tell about a, a, a dog that um, you know gives a good example here where a, a man goes to visit his friend. They're sitting out on the porch, they're having a drink, um, enjoying the sunset, and he's got one of those big uh, bloodhounds lying on the porch with them while he's on his rocking chair. And every now and again, the dog is making a real horrible wincing noise, but the owner just completely ignores it. And uh, this goes on for an hour or so while they're drinking whatever they're drinking, and the dog just keeps making noises. And uh, the man eventually says to him, is your dog okay? And the man says, oh, yeah, he's absolutely fine. He said, but he keeps making a noise. Why is he making such a horrible, painful noise? And the man says, oh, it's because he's lying on a nail. And the other man says to him, oh, why is he lying on the nail? And he answers and says, it's because the nail isn't hurting him enough yet. And for me, that's kind of how I see awareness and desire. We all do things all the time that actually are not fixing anything and we put up with it. And we don't really have enough awareness to get us to desire. We have to 
help our teammates to realize that there's a better way of doing things. So once we've got some sense of desire to change, then we've got to build the ability. We've got to help people understand what the tool set is, uh, what the toolbox might look like, and then provide some sort of training so that people can actually pick up some new skills that maybe they've never had before. Um, if you're like me, you're, you're probably always trying to create cross-functional teams, but failing dismally because not a lot of people actually want to be cross-functional. I haven't, I haven't met a, 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 a core C++ developer yet that really wants to learn how to test. Um, typically, testers don't necessarily want to learn how to do coding either. Um, it's, it's tricky. It's tricky trying to get people to learn new skills that are outside of their comfort zone. But that's, that's part of the process. And then, of course, the next two steps here, promotion and transfer. We move from ability into promotion where with a team, you may get some quick wins. With a team, you may get some results. And then you want to start doing some sort of show and tell, whether that's at your big room planning quarterly event, whether it's at a town hall event, whatever it might be. You want to start sharing those success stories so that there's some real interest from other teams who would look back and go, well, actually, we could probably do some of that. And that that's you know stuff that we want to be involved with. We want to get those sort of results and outcomes too. And if that's the way that team's doing it, well, actually, I think we should give it a go too. And that's where you get these, these transfer. Uh, and, and that's what we mean by having transfer is a, the, that good knowledge and experience and a little bit of FOMO as well as crept in and people decide that they want to, to do the same thing. This is, this is, I'm just going to say, it's really strange for me doing it this way. I'm so used to talking in person and it's dead quiet in my headset. It's really weird. Somebody turn the mic on and just we're still breathe, here. will you? We're still here. <laughs> yeah, we're, we're still here, honest. Thank you very much. Thank you. I think every now and again, I'm just going to say any questions and I'm just going to wait for somebody <laughs> to say, no, that's good, just to make me feel better. So as a typical uh, business analyst, I'm going to say, what problem are we trying to solve? And this is where we're going to start using that, that framework. We've got, uh, we're at our awareness stage, this, this knowledge or perception of a situation or fact. So let's start to try and think about what is the problem that we're trying to solve? Oh, all right, gone too far. Um, what I wanted to be really clear on here, and, and this is uh, something that, that I got reminded of the other day when I was in a workshop, and somebody was saying to me, I want, I've articulated the problem and they put it up on the whiteboard or on the, on the screen and they're reading it out to me. And I looked at it and I, I, I thought for a second and, and, he, and the person said to me, so do you think I need to refine it at all? And I said, I think you actually need to reword the whole thing because what you've actually captured is not a problem. What you've actually stated is, is the position. It's the thing you're observing or you're seeing or you're feeling you haven't actually told me what the problem is. And so before we go on to the next slide, which is actually giving you some real world uh, observations of mine, I thought we'd I'd just introduce you to my approach to this and what I use to keep myself in check. Um, so what I say to myself is I, I like to, I always go back to my doctor scenario, which is the one that always helps me. And I imagine I'm stood in front of a doctor telling him my arm's hurting. Now the doctor, knows that that isn't actually the root cause of the problem. There's something else. He knows that what I'm telling him is a symptom that I'm seeing, I'm feeling, or I'm hearing. My arm hurts. My body's designed to tell me these symptoms, but it might not be the root cause. It might be that I've done something um, that's related. Uh, and if any of you have, uh, you know, back problems or anything like that, sometimes you, your neck will hurt or some other part of your body will hurt because actually somewhere else in your body has got injured. And so you have to ask yourself, okay, well, if, if my arm is hurting and that's just the symptom, is your arm stopping you from driving home? And if you have no money for the bus, that's probably the problem. There's a problem that needs solving because the arm hurting is just the symptom. What the result of that is, is actually the problem that you're facing, whatever it may be. And many, many years ago, I was, I was taught something by an IBM salesman. 
I'm not going to tell you how many years ago because that really would show my age. Um, but he introduced me to the four P's and the four P's stand for position, problem, possibilities, and proposal. And I use those very, very frequently to remind me how to phrase things and how to look at things. So when I think about position, I, I'm listing the symptom. I'm listing the things that I'm seeing, that um, I'm observing on my on my walks, my gimbal walks, or when I'm hanging out with a team just to observe how they work. Um, I'm I'm looking at what what what's the position that I'm seeing? What are they doing? What are they? How are they sounding? Are they are they bantering with each other? Are they not listening to each other? What what is what are the things that is creating this this current position? And then working out right what is the problem with that position? What's that going to cause? Then I'll step through, once I've got one once I'm clear on that I'll step through into the possibilities for resolving that problem, and then creating a proposal at the end. It's quite a conversational, almost story-like approach to analytical thinking. And obviously, there's a bunch of tools that you throw in there that we'll cover off in a moment. Um, but that's that's my basic framework to keep me in check to make sure I'm actually identifying problems, not just positions or symptoms. Um, so I always like to think, you know, I'll stop and just take a breath and say, what would I say to the doctor? Uh, because that's probably my symptom or my position, not the problem. Hopefully that's... Uh, new to some of you and a reminder to, to some, some others, the four Ps. So here's our doctor, best picture of a doctor I could find in, my, in Microsoft PowerPoint, <laughs> not a great one. So I thought we'd, we'd do some examples. Um, and again, uh, this is a, an interactive session. So if you, uh, if you turn your mics on and maybe uh, heckle out when I ask questions. So here we are, we're gonna, gonna list off a few things here. But before I show you mine, um, I'd like to hear from from people in the I was going to say in the room, but on on what do you say on digital things in digital land? Um, order taking a solution statement. It's an observation that I see happening far too much. Not only see it, but I hear it from from colleagues of mine and, and people in my network. What do you think would be the outcome? or some of the outcomes that you either think or that you've seen or experienced if a team does order taking of its solution statement. Over to you. Anyone? Disaster because you don't fix the problem. Absolutely. Yeah. I like the word straight away, disaster. Yeah, you might not scale. actually resolve the problem. And it might not be the best solution for actually solving the problem. Just check, you can't see my notes, right? Correct. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Absolutely. Absolutely. Your, your team's been told what the solution is, or worse, they, they, your team's been handed the solution that the business have already purchased, which is um, something that, again, happens way too frequently. Um, you discover that it doesn't work. Um, or it doesn't integrate with your existing infrastructure. Um, you discover that your technology environment already has the capability to do the thing that's just been purchased. But nobody knew because just like at the beginning of the slide pack, we didn't bother looking in the cockpit. We didn't bother understanding the environment before we started doing something about changing it. And, and now we're paying double. We're paying for two things instead of just one. Um, and potentially the worst thing is the thing that we purchased, as somebody just said, doesn't even solve the problem um, because it's actually still occurring. So I totally agree. Here's my ones. Uh, you end up not solving the root cause at all because you didn't spend any time figuring out what the root cause of the problem actually was in the first place. You miss the opportunity to uh, reuse an existing capability that you already had. And you purchase a sled sledgehammer to crack it up. You've got this massive system that has, you know, 10,000 features. You really only needed one. Next one. Again, question out to the room. What happens if we start coding right away? 
what could go wrong there? You build the wrong thing. That's a classic one. Absolutely. You build the wrong thing. So the user story says users must be able to log in using method X. That's all you need to know, right? Method X. I'm going to code for that. Right. OK, let's go. Let's go set our desks and code. Um, we go straight into it. We're coding our tech implementation. We're creating the packages. We're building our pieces of code. You end up building something that's carelessly complex instead of relentlessly simple. Um, and then the next sprint, when the user story says the users must also be able to now log on using method Y, you suddenly realize that you've got to massively refactor your user story um, and, and your, your work because you didn't spend any time thinking up front about additional modular functionality that you might need. Now, I'm not just stepping back for a sec. I'm not suggesting that we do big upfront requirements. I'm just saying, actually, because payment method methods are a known thing, yeah. if we'd have spent a little bit of time up front, we probably would have done it differently instead of jumping straight in on, on coding. Um, maybe you didn't ask any questions at refinement with your product over. Maybe you didn't ask any questions at sprint planning. Maybe you didn't ask any questions during last sprint. You just went along, you just started coding. Um, there are, by the way, I'm just being reminded, there are lots of links that I will send you. When I, when, when I send out this pack, there are references to all the examples that I'm giving and all the tools and, and, and uh, any references that I've used during this, this slide pack, you'll be able to go and read for yourself. So again, the problem, we haven't quite understood what it is that we're solving. We might end up with bloated buggy code. Code refactoring frequency is higher than it should be. So those are things that we can actually measure. What about designing without any initial requirements? What do you think could possibly go wrong there? Overbuild or underbuild? Yeah. So my example would be, you start designing for a car parking solution. Don't worry, Ruth, I'm not going to say anything. Um, <laughs> you've got, you haven't got enough good level of high, a good level of high level, sorry, good high level requirements. Um, and you, you don't really have any initial user stories, but you've got three other car parks that you operate. So, you know, you, you, you think that you're, pretty okay if you take the existing design, just grab it from the library, rename it for this new one, and that's a good start. Model it out for the data flows, load balancing, job done. And then when you're actually implementing, the business people come to you and say, well, where are the handheld devices? And everybody looks at each other and goes, handheld devices? What do we need handheld devices for? That wasn't in the design. And it turns out that actually this particular car park needs a handheld device operated by a particular user for manually triggering the car park boom arm for when it needs overriding. But because we didn't have those initial high level requirements, we didn't spend some time just understanding the as is, we missed that bit. The design looked right. The, the architecture was done correctly. The solution design was done correctly, uh, but done correctly without Understand, understanding that that uh, that quarry that we were just about to jump into. And so we miss something. So when we design without initial requirements, the design is a guess. Expect lots of redesign later on. If you design without requirements, there's an inability to integrate with emerging requirements that come out later on. And there's a reduction of trust from your stakeholders as the design doesn't meet the expectations. And so unfortunately, you, know, you end up with a bit of egg on your face and you lose a little bit of uh, a little bit of kudos. And last but not least, not considering any business rules. What do you think could go wrong there? Anybody on the call who's in insurance? Oh, no insurance people? Okay. So my example is an insurance example. 
So imagine your team is building an automated uh, loan approval solution and you know the basics, you know what the customer needs to have enough disposable income to be able to service the loan. However, you didn't spend enough time digging deeper and discovering that your company, your financial institution that you work for is not approving loans this year for people with a certain level of outstanding debts for a certain amount. Um, and you miss that. Um, and you start, or the system, based on how you've coded it, starts handing out approvals uh, to people that are going to increase the risk profile of the business, potentially put customers in a worse position um, than they should be in. Maybe this story will get into the news and potentially hurt the organization's uh, standing. Maybe the share price will go down. All because we didn't spend some time understanding that, that, uh, that the business rules that might be required to be applied here. So not considering business rules, holes in the solution that increase the risk profile, loss of damage through unexpected use, and cause your business to be fined due to a breach in compliance potentially. So there's just four, these are, these are actual things I've seen. I'm not making these up. So these are actual things I've seen over the last five, six, seven years that actually still happen. Now, if anybody's brave enough, does anybody on the call want to share that they've seen any of this sort of behavior at their own place of work? I'm going to guess that all of your mic buttons aren't working. Yeah, uh, everyone's been very shy. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe they're worried about it being career limiting. Nick. It's probably because we're recording, right? <laughs> All right. No worries. Nick, Nick do you want Lord and I to say anything? Well, look, no, it's fine. I mean, I, I'll, I'll, I'm, I'm okay to admit that you know we do see some of this sort of stuff. I, I'd be very surprised yeah. if it's not happening elsewhere. When, when I did this talk with the IIBA group, which was a room full of business analysts, uh, and there is a video of that online. There was, there was a lot of. We didn't name names, but essentially every organisation in the room had some level of each of these happening. So uh, I'll just assume that that's still correct for everybody on the call and not, not ask you to call it out. Yeah, I can mm. guarantee it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and of course, all of this put together makes for very unhappy customers. It just means that, you know, stakeholders and customers are not getting what they should be getting. Um, and a lot of this is because we're actually not putting enough effort into the analytical thinking side of, of, uh, of, of delivering software and solutions. Um, we're, we're spending a lot of time on, on coding and testing, but when we're potentially not spending enough time on analytical thinking. So how do we make a change? How do we change these behaviors? Um, we need to build some desire. We need to build this strong feeling of wanting to have something or wishing for something to happen. So let's assume we've created the awareness and we, we've got people believing there's a lack of analytical thinking. How do we build this desire to change? Here's my little chart that uh, hopefully will suggest some, uh, some ideas as to how we get through this. Um, top one I'm going to start with is, is primary sponsor in engagement. We've got a primary sponsor. They want an outcome that's good for their organization and then also for their customer. Having them on board, wanting the same thing that we do, talking to our team or teams and introducing this idea of, of a greater level of analytical thinking within our teams is a good way to get things started. A good team experiment is always a good way to go. You know, as a coach, you're working with your teams through your, your retros or through your, your, um, your uh, continuous improvement. And using the scientific method, you can call out a hypothesis and, and start to work with your teams to actually work through an experiment and see if there's an impact of introducing one technique or one approach or spending a little bit, tire, a little bit more time on business rules this sprint. Articulating the gains is all about being able to show to the team or talk through with the team what's in it for them. Um, what are they going to get out of it? What are the customers going to get out of it? And I would suggest using something like um, game stormings on the cover activity for this one. Um, it allows you to step into the future and look back on what you've done and 
write down uh, what people have said about you or about your team, how things are different now, and what some of those, if you were on a magazine cover for the, the, the amazing amount of uh, outcome you've, you've been able to deliver, what would those be? those big bullet uh, point news stories be about and allows you to creatively visualize um, what those gains might feel and look like. Obviously, positive coaching involvement, having your coach working with the team, uh, identifying opportunities for analytical thinking. If the team aren't used to doing it, they probably will need some prompting. So uh, we coaches need to be able to point out, hey, guys, do you think it would be a good idea here to maybe spend some time mapping out what the, what the rules are for this? Or maybe we could do a bit of a whiteboard session and just map out what the process looks like. And so I would encourage you as coaches to always think about those, uh, those W and H words, the who, when, why, where, what, and how. And if you can't remember them, write them down on a piece of paper on sticky notes and carry them around with you everywhere you go the who when why where what and how is uh, is something that we'll we'll carry on with in a moment a good old uh oh don't hang on i'll i'll do this one first art of the possible art of the possible is something where you can either go and see another team doing this well um whether it's in your own organization or it might be in a another organization, you might want to do an agile safari and go and actually visit a team that does this well and go and see how they do it. And then last but not least, good old team incentive. Maybe it's a cake, maybe it's a team lunch, maybe it's a trip to game on, whatever it might be. What is that incentive that you can use with your team to, to create some motivation and desire to actually do something um, that's going to flip the dial a little bit? So let's, let's assume that uh, we're moving in the right direction, that we've built some desire. What could old versus new actually look like? So here's, here's, here's my suggestion. And again, this is based on experience. The old behavior was start coding straight away. What could we do? Maybe the team could gather around the whiteboard um, at the start of, uh, on the first day of the sprint. And maybe we're gonna swarm on a single user story. Uh, and together, we're going to do a system context diagram or maybe a scope context diagram that allows us as teammates to actually understand the entire scope of the user story um, and understand it from all the different perspectives so it's not just one person's view of the world that's one thing that i've, I've certainly promote to try and change this old behavior and get coders away from their desks and standing at the whiteboard to actually start doing some analytical thinking Order taking of a solution, a little bit tougher this one, but the new behavior would be pushing back in favor of actually doing some root cause workshop. Uh, you wanna do some root cause analysis. You wanna introduce a, a spike story into your sprint um, because actually you as a team have recognized that what you're being handed is a solution, not a problem, and that it might not be the right thing for you to accept. So you might want to push back as a team and say, no, we need to we need to look at that in a bit more detail. Let's do a spike story. Let's find out actually what's going on here and let's build something next sprint once we've got some more understanding about it. So very much around the sort of not ready story. It's uh, it's not not falling into our invest mnemonic, if you like. And then that last one, not considering business rules. So at the start of the sprint, maybe the whole team starts with the rules. Um, as a BA, I was always told to start with the business rules. You could either start with data, you could start with rules, or you could start with process. And I was, I was always encouraged to start with the business rules first and understand those, because those are the constraints that, that you need to work within. And so maybe, maybe instead of jumping straight into building, we spend some time at the work at the, at the whiteboard, and we'll, we'll spend some time defining uh, the rules for maybe the top five uh, product backlog items before we actually do anything else before we come away from the the scrum board i say that i say that has, it, has anybody actually built a physical scrum board recently are we all digital now i miss the physical scrum boards yeah. God, somebody tell me um, you've still got one uh, no uh, everything's 
digital now. Oh, no. Yeah. <laughs> Such a shame. I miss the tactile. Mike Lawrence will tell you how fond I am of physical boards and post-it notes. But Yep. I'm with you. All right, let's move on to ability then. So the possession of the means or the skill to be able to do something. And uh, people on the call, Sonali, Todd, Ruth, you'll recognize my uh, use of the word toolbox here. Um, so what's in our agile toolbox? How can we, what skills do we need to use or what skills do we need to develop and, and, and acquire to be able to give us the, uh, the opportunity to uh, do something new? Now, a while back, I wrote an article back in 2016 when I first started considering a lot of these issues. Um, and I'm going to use this same model that I did on the whiteboard back at uh, Equinox IT um, because I think it's still, still reasonably valid. I'm going to carry this on in the next slide. But question for you first, for everybody on the call, there's a really important tool that you should have in your kit bag. It's probably the most important tool for an Agile team. What do you think it is? Nick's there it mobile is. number. <laughs> <laughs> Nick's mobile number. That's one that's answer. Right. Yep. yep, yep. <laughs> Anybody else? Your ears or your brain? Ears and brain are good. Yep. Yep. If I said I can't see into your ears or into your brain, and I'd really like to see inside your brain to see what you're thinking. Does that give you a clue as to what the answer might be? Post-it notes. So what was that? Post-it notes? What, what are you going to stick the post-it notes on? Whiteboard. Oh, there you board. go. Yeah. I think this is probably the simplest and most effective tool for Agile teams and certainly for introducing analytical thinking into your agile teams it doesn't have to be a physical whiteboard if you're 100 percent remote which i know some of you are um you can use miro or muriel or any of the new whiteboard tools that seem to have suddenly sprung up um i'm guessing most people use miro it seems to be the most favorite but yeah the whiteboard if you're not used to using it get used to using them get used to collaboratively whiteboarding with your teammates because it's the most effective tool there is so now I'm going to dive into um, the, the framework that I'm actually going to show you what my brain looks like inside um, and, and expose that to you and how I actually think. So here's the digital or tidied up version of that whiteboard sketch that I did. Here's my feature or my user story. I now have my who, my what and my why. So as a, I want, so that. And then on the other side, when we used to flip the user story card over back when it was physical, we'd flip it over and we'd write some stuff on the back. We'd write the success criteria for the feature, or we might write the acceptance criteria for the user story. And there we're concentrating on the well, whens and the whys and the hows. So if I build that out slightly, that's what it looks like. For me, it's, okay, so who is about knowing who my stakeholders are. The what is understanding the scope understanding the need, understanding the structure. The why is understanding that root cause and the strategic alignment. And then on the flip side, I wanna understand what my constraints are. When does this need to happen? Where in the process does this need to happen? What location does it need to happen at? And the how, understanding the physical or technical behavior, how quickly does it need to respond? Uh, understand its design. If you take that model and then map tools, the analytical tools that we would need to use to be able to fully understand the scope of this user story. And remember, this is a, 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 a full model. I'm not expecting, for, I'm, I'm warning you before I put this slide up. Um, these are all of the tools. I don't use all of them all the time on every single uh, instance. But these are some of the tools that I will use when I'm looking at either a feature or a user story. So knowing my stakeholders, I could use a very quite traditional stakeholder analysis approach where I'm looking at knowledge levels of the stakeholders. I'm looking at their influence versus power, uh, their power versus interest, or maybe some more modern persona modeling. If I want to understand scope, I'll be using something like a use case diagram. Um, I might use a scope context diagram. 
I'm going to give you examples of these at the moment. So you'll see some of these for real if you don't know what they are. And for those of you that have some of these things on here that you don't recognize at all, there is links in the slide pack that I'll send out so you can go and investigate and, and go and do some self-learning. Maybe I want to understand the need. So here I might use an empathy map. I might use a value proposition canvas to really understand what it is that my customer is trying to do. I might use some uh, a lotus blossom is a, is a favorite brainstorming technique of mine that allows me to do more targeted brainstorming. Domain modeling, underused, but so, so useful for understanding the structure of your problem. Root cause, fishbone diagrams, five whys, very, very useful. And then on the flip side over here, we have decision trees, rule flow diagrams, flow charts. BPMN 2.0 is just a, a de facto standard for flow charting. But you know what? Keep it simple, blocks and lines, because if you're going to talk to business people, simple flow charts is the way to go. Non-functional requirements. Maybe you're a product developer. You need to start thinking about some of the metrics and the frameworks you're going to use. Maybe you need to think about design. You want to do some prototyping system context diagrams, data modeling, UX. So there's a whole bunch of tools that I would typically use, but obviously not all at the same time. And what I've done is just put some black dots on these to show if I was going to work with a team to introduce analytical thinking, these are the ones that I would say are the minimum that I would expect a high performing team who maybe is high performing and delivering stuff, but the outcome isn't quite what they wanted. It's not quite hitting the mark. These are the ones that I would introduce and say, the, these are your staple of making sure that you and your teammates are, are actually spending enough time doing some analytical thinking. Any questions on my messy uh, slice of my brain that I've exposed you to, other than the shocking colors? Any questions at that point? I, I think it's fantastic that you've got um, all of these different techniques just on one page <laughs> and how they actually relate. Um, so I don't care how messy it is and what the colours are like. Excellent. Thank you for the feedback. Spoken, spoken like a true analyst there. I mean, it's, it is. I mean, these are, these are, this is, we you know, go back to the definition of, of uh, analytical thinking. This is uh, cause and effect related items to each other which is kind of how my brain works. So I thought I'd keep myself in check and say, let's see if our toolbox that we've just introduced you to is actually geared up for, for correctly anal doing analytical thinking. So over on the left, we've got our definition of analytical thinking, the ability to identify and define problems. I think we can use the five whys or a fishbone diagram approach, sometimes called Ishikawa after its uh, inventor, or just, it's got three names, cause and effect diagram, fishbone diagram, Ishikawa diagram. Value proposition canvas, we can use that to understand our, our customers' problems and what their, their gains and pains are. Maybe we could map out a flow chart and find out where the problem is being caused within the end-to-end -end flow, or a system context diagram. Um, to identify where within system flows that their problem is occurring. So I, I think we've got enough there, but I'm, I'm looking for you guys to, to validate for me. Can I, if, if you believe, if you agree with me, that we've got enough tools there to identify and define our problem, then I'm going to put a green tick in my box. What do you reckon? Tick. Tick. Extracting key information yep. from the data. So, most, most software development, not, not all non-software developments capture data, but here we'd be using a domain model to try and capture those main classes or those main objects that we're discussing. Um, we might want to go down into a bit more detail, looking at attributes of those data, of that data classes. Maybe we're going to do some documentation analysis to be able to look at old data or spreadsheets or extracts and reports to understand what the data is and how we're going to transform that into information. So again, I think we've got enough tools there in our kit bag to at least get us started. Interviews would I would interviews. interviews yep. for that one. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah, good call. In fact, I haven't put interviews on my messy main brain chart. That should definitely be in there. Thank you for that. Um, developing the workable solution. So this was us 
trying to get to that first uh, hypothesis test. Um, we probably don't want to build anything at this stage, even a prototype. We might want to just use some sort of model. Um, so that could be a use case diagram coupled with some non-functional requirements so that we understand how it's going to behave, not just what it's going to do. Uh, we might want to model out what the flowchart looks like to make sure that we're, we've actually come up with a solution that, that is going to get the end-to-end -end outcome with some rules um, or, or you know, using either a business rule model or a decision tree. So I believe I've got enough tools in my kit bag there. And then maybe I want to fully test it. Maybe I want to go out on the street or, or get a, a focus group to test my potential solution here. So I might want to build a prototype, whether that's a paper, cardboard, low code, no code, whatever it might be. Um, I probably want to build something so I can test it. And then last but not least, developing actually developing the solution to resolve the problem. Well, I've already got quite a bit of information in my first iteration. Um, I can carry on with those and use those same tools when we actually start building it for real. So here I've got my use cases, or maybe you want to model a feature or use a story map for that instead of a use case diagram, depending on what your, your approach is and which tools you're familiar with. System context diagram, so I can see how it all hangs together and what the scope is. Data modeling to understand how my data is going to react to each other. Persona modeling for my stakeholders, rules for my decision tree, flowchart for my flow, and then behavioral um, requirements for my non-functional requirements. So I think, if you agree with me, that there's enough within that messy brain chart that actually hits all of those five uh, parts of the definitions of, uh, of analytical thinking. Does everybody agree? Yep. Nice. Awesome. Thanks for that. So let's jump into promotion. I'm just looking at my timer. I'm, I'm, I must have been talking slowly. Is everybody okay for time if I slightly run over? I'll, I'll, we're into the tail end of it now, so I'll speed up. So really what I'm going to show you now is all of what I've just talked about in action so that you know I'm not talking rubbish. So let's, let's do some of the promotion. So let's see how this has been used in the real world. Now, I won't go through all of the text in detail because we won't, we really will run over time there. But I just wanted to introduce you to some of those key things. So here we have, for those of you that have never seen one before, this is a system context diagram. Um, and you can see it's for a pharmaceutical fulfillment system. You can see there's finance, there's inventory, there's uh, internal incoming orders, uh, customer service. And we've got all of the different flows of the requests that are coming through. So there is a flow in here, but it's not laid out like a flow chart. What it does is it shows me all of the interconnected systems, organizations, and people that are involved in the scope of this particular piece of work. Why would I use it? It provides the team with a big picture view of everything that's involved that might be in scope for this feature or this user story. It visually conveys that scope. When would you use it? Early on. I would definitely be getting one of these done early on if I was starting out in a project with my teammates um, and then reviewing and embellishing it at the end, at the start of every sprint. This would be a working, uh, a working copy. Who should do it? I think the whole team should be involved. I don't think any one member of the team should build this in isolation because going through the journey of building this really solidifies in everybody's minds what it is we're trying to achieve. Here's an example of one. This was a, a, a very quick and a dirty one we did in one of the teams I worked with, and I'll try and talk you through what this actually was. Uh, four years ago, four years ago, this team with me, we were trying to work out what could we build that would um, increase the NPS needle, delight our customers. Here you can see there is QR code food ordering. That was the idea under investigation. And we thought, oh, we could we could use QR codes in in-room dining. We would have to use FastPay, which is a system at the time that would be used for paying for it. What about a street order? What about being able to order it in the casino? Um, how is FastPay linked into counter 
Um, and then how does that get through the Sky City app and also this database called Source? Um, what about the new POS system called TAF that we were putting in? And how would we scan and pay if we were on the street? And so you can see we've just started trying to talk through all of the places, the systems, and the interconnectivity of this, this very basic early idea. You can see this is Andy's burgers down here. I'm sure that my drawing here was so accurate that all of you recognize that as Andy's burgers on, on the Sky City uh, precinct. And if any of you haven't been yet, today we reopened uh, Andy's burgers. We've got robots now. Definitely worth going and having a look at the, the serving robots and QR, QR uh, food ordering, by the way, which is, uh, we didn't build it, uh, but we had the idea for it four years ago, just saying. Here's, a, here's another one. Uh, this is probably more of a system context diagram, a little bit more detailed. Uh, we've got some, some system components and how data is flowing through those and then some of the rules that are triggering different flows through that. Um, my team and I, when we were building this solution, we used these sort of things a lot. We did them on day one of the sprint. And as you can see, you see this, this red loop around here? This is us saying there's a user story and it's three points. There's another user story, it's three points. There's an eight. That one there is an eight. I will remember this particular user story for the rest of my life because this eight user story turned into seven user stories and a total of 40 story points. So it was one of the biggest mistakes we made, hence the reason why I remember it. Flowcharts are awesome for just trying to understand what is going to happen and also where the problem might be occurring because you can visualize it. So again, get, the, get it up on the wall. Doesn't need to be a BPMN diagram. I just, I love BPMN, so that's probably why I go to it, but it could just be blobs and lines. Again, you could do it at the start of your project or at the start of your sprint and whoever's working with you, they're the people that you want with you at the wall. Um, maybe the BA in the team with the person with the skills is gonna run that exercise, but everybody should be involved. Prototyping, again, you can see we've just used paper. We didn't go, go by. We always started with paper because it's just so much easier to sketch out. And there's so many tools out there nowadays where you can sketch something out and then take a photo of it and turn your drawings into buttons. Um, and then even, even in PowerPoint, you can do this. I, I used to prototype in PowerPoint all the time. It just gets the team aligned really quickly because you've got something tangible and you can even put that in front of your product owner or your stakeholder on the on the first day of sprint and go, is this what you meant? Because this is how we think it's going to work. Impact mapping was on the brain map. Um, we used that a lot because we had a lot of uh, things that we thought we needed to do and changes that we thought we needed to occur. And we needed to know who was going to help or hinder us to make those changes so that we could achieve this goal, which uh, is very, very small, but it basically says something along the lines of we're going to deliver something uh, by a certain time and it's going to be fantastic. So we had to work out who's going to help and hinder us. What are the changes that we need to see those people take part in or the behavioral changes that we want to see? And then what are we going to do to make those things happen? I think this is a really powerful tool. You can use it for a lot of different reasons, but I do think it's a very powerful tool to avoid people jumping into solution mode. And it does allow the team to bridge the gap between business impacts and feature ideas. So a very cool tool if you've not used that yet. There's uh, Goiko Adzik, Adzik is, your, is your guy, and he's written a book on, on uh, impact mapping, which is well worth a read if you haven't read it yet. Decision mapping. Pretty simple here, probably not the best decision tree you've ever seen in your life. But as you can see, we started very early on in this sprint saying, well, if the phone changes color, you need to wait six weeks and collect your new card on your next visit. visit. Or if the phone changes color and there's no waiting, send the card direct to the customer by post. Or if the phone doesn't change color, show the upgrade approved, but pending wait six weeks, collect card on next visit. And so we were building out what those rules were going to be and how we would then have to build a solution around those rules, not building the making the business change because we'd come up with some technology solutions. 
So really, those are there just to show you that that this is all stuff that's happened for real within uh, within my experience. I thought I'd end up closing out with a bit of a story. Don't worry, this isn't. Uh, I'm not going to now start pitching you that the Earth is flat. Um, it's just a picture of a dome. Um, so the story goes: once upon a time, there was a land where the whole community lived under this big glass dome. For generations, families have been born, they lived, they died under this big glass dome. Um, and the story had been passed down to everybody that uh, if if anyone was ever to step outside the glass dome, you'd surely die. So nobody ever dared to step outside the glass dome. And in fact, the community decided there was no crime so dastardly that the punishment for anyone who committed that crime would be to banish them outside the dome, which would mean certain death for them. Uh, no one had ever committed that crime that was so bad. But then one day, to the community's horror, a man did commit such a crime. And the punishment was swift, the whole community, they escorted the man to the edge of the glass dome and they pushed him out into the world beyond and they all then pushed their faces up against the glass, waiting to see this man uh, shivering in fear, as waiting for him to die. Um, and all of a sudden, this man didn't die. He, he started shaking himself off and uh, started raising it to his knees. And the people inside the dome looked on in amazement as he stood to his knees and started kicking the dirt around, and running about in the grass and started smiling and laughing and jumping around with joy. And he's shouting at the people inside the glass saying, come on, come out and dance with me. You guys, come out. It's great out here. The people were filled with confusion, but bewilderment to see this happy dancing man. They would expected to see him die this horrible death. Confusion and stress grew so much for them that they had to take action. They got buckets of black paint and they started painting the bottom of the walls and they painted the walls solid black as high as they could reach up so that they could no longer see the dancing man. Then they all breathed a sigh of relief, went back to the way things had been before. And what was his crime that he had committed? He was an innovator. And I'd like to, there was a story by Wallace Ford and I'd like to put it to you that we are those innovators and change agents. We're on the outside of the wall. It's our job to get those people inside that dome to not paint the walls and to come with us and see what it's like on the outside. And that, everybody, is the end of my talk. And this is a photo of the team that I worked with where a lot of the uh, photos that were taken at the end of that session there, this was our little, uh, sprint area um, where we did all of our work physically before lockdowns. Sorry, I've gone a little bit over. Is there any questions, any clarity that anybody wants? We've got, a, we've got someone asking for the reference for the impact mapping book. Yes. So uh, I'll just show you. There is, can you see these pages here? I've yes. put in links in these packs in this pack for all of the tools that I've listed in my messy brain diagram. So you'll have access to all of those when I send out the pack. So you can go and do your own reading and, and study up on all of those techniques. Hopefully right. that answers that question. Yeah. Any other questions? Oh, somebody asked a question earlier on. Um, yeah. How do you deal with the order taking problem? of a solution when time is critical. Yeah. Um, this I mean, just you... needs to get done. <laughs> so. Yes, of course. <laughs> and and sometimes you can't solve that one. Um, it, it's sometimes, and especially if it's, if it's somebody who's very well paid and high up in the organization, um, sometimes you cannot do anything about it. So this isn't a foolproof method. Um, there are times when you are going to have to just do the thing. Um, but I would I would encourage anybody to use the tools to enlighten whoever it is in the best way, the best career, not limited, not limiting approach <laughs> to just educate them that, OK, um, this solution enables this capability. Are you aware that we have something that already does that? just so that they're making that decision and that request on you with their eyes open, because maybe they don't know. 
obviously the horse may have already bolted and they bought it but i always like to just i'm not saying no i'm saying just be aware there's these things already that could do that um or have you thought about this and are you clear that the problem what the problem is and if they still want to go ahead with it you've done you've done what you could do to just help them take a breath and they're either going to listen or they're not um i, I was the one who actually wrote that that question and I, and I was asking it in the context of actually where i'm currently at where we kind of found that at the beginning we we had a lot of some of the ideas that you had but as time moved on and as certain deadlines didn't you know move on um, yep. a lot of the things started falling off the, the rails right and suddenly what used to be a democracy suddenly became more of a authoritarian kind of okay this is how you need to do it to get it done and that scope of discussion sort of disappears and you kind of understand because of the pressure that you're all on uh, when you start seeing death marches and working over yep. weekends, I mean, you wouldn't expect to do all of these stuff and then still be expected to work in the weekend as well. So I guess it's that point where, like, where do you decide? Okay, well, it's time to call it a day, and like, it's time to take a break. Yeah, I, I think the answer to that would be that that the root cause of your problem is actually that uh, you are either in a situation where you can't extend your deadline, or you're not being allowed to vary scope. And for all the other people on the call that, that have uh, got some skin in the game and, and some years experience, they know that uh, trying to hit a deadline is only possible when we're allowed to vary the scope. Because if we sign up to do all the requirements that were listed on day one, it's just not going to happen. So I think there's there's potentially a, a, an issue there, a root cause there for you, where um, your implementation of Agile, assuming that you're trying to do Scrum, is um is not quite hitting the hitting the mark from our understanding mm. how projects um should be approached within an agile framework yeah yeah absolutely there are plenty of coaches out there and organizations that will be able to help you with that yeah um, the but iron triangle <laughs> i think exactly the iron triangle it, it's uh, you just you cannot do it it's 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 just physically not possible a good question i mean that that's um and, and I, I do feel for you that is a situation which many of us on the call have probably been in many times and it's not a, it's not a nice one right before i wrap things up any any final questions and okay i'll just quickly tell you for the rest of the people that are still here um our next meetup is going to be an in real lifer um Yay. The, the zero officers and it's going to be a meetup also with Product Tank. So uh, keep an eye out for that one coming as soon. Um, Nick, you're going to make some of these references available. Do you want yeah. us to, to share them um, through the, the Slack group or our YouTube? Or... Um, I'll, I'll put the pack into a PDF so that all the links and clicks are all available to everyone so they can follow yeah. those links. And then is the best thing to do to give it to you to distribute? Or... Yeah, I think we should be able to get everybody's details from the meetup thing so i'll, I'll do I'll that i'll get it to you that. brilliant well look thanks nick for yet again another great um agile Auckland discussion uh let's not leave it so long next time okay and i just want to <laughs> echo what somebody put in the chat there thanks for the session and you've got an amazing brain thank you, <laughs> so, <laughs> thank you very much my pleasure everybody i, I hope it's uh it's something that you're going to be able to use all right take care and thanks a lot everyone see you soon thank you everybody thanks nick that was awesome cheers all thank you <laughs>